my name is Andrea Burton. I'm the local track chair for the user experience track. Um, I introduced Namho Park yesterday, the other featured speaker. For those of you who weren't in the room, this is the first year we have a user experience track at DrupalCon. And it seems, after Karen McGrain's uh, keynote, it seems to be pretty relevant. And I've been attending all the user experience tracks, and they've been pretty packed out. So um, it's obvious that we are all interested in this, in the Drupal sphere. Um, I want to introduce Chris Lowe. He is the user experience lead director of strategy of Medan. Uh, Medan is a nonprofit based in San Francisco that works specifically in Arabic English translation on the web. They create journalism apps for multilingual. Um, I used to work with Chris at Medan, and he also has a background in user experience, worked for Bolt Peters in San Francisco doing uh, user experience research and uh, building a user experience app. Um, he's also just a really good friend of mine. Uh, design, we design Nerd Out, we share music. I th he's a great thinker and he's a great speaker and I'm really excited for you guys to uh, get inside his brain a little bit. Um, me, Dan, works in Drupal. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you guys are doing in Drupal these days, but uh, he works with Kareem Ratib who wrote Use Bulk Operations, really awesome guy up in Vancouver, um, and a Drupal person. So anyway, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let Chris get to it. Thank you for being here. Let's all welcome Chris. Shut up. Hey, everybody. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I love DrupalCon. Man, that keynote was absolutely spot on. So. I'm totally set up here. This is going to be perfect. I have just a few things to disagree with her about. Uh, notably, I do think the future is ops. So. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is talk about ops and design, two things that don't go together very often. Uh, I got a screen grab here from Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001, that great 18th century painting uh, versus the uh, 21st century, 22nd century, 23rd century. Uh, we'll see where this goes. So, this is probably one of the uh, wildest talks I've done, actually. Uh, it's pretty simple. We just can digest this slide real quick. Uh, talking about design ops, it's just a buzzword I invented. Sorry to give that away early on, but uh, I really want to talk about UX industry issues, about guilt, about shame, about fear, all kinds of things I know you aliens deal with on a daily basis, people put down PhD especially. Uh, and I want to remain grounded in some ostensibly useful advice about uh, Books, pens, pencils, UX dashboards, and uh, double sided scotch tape is very important. And my analysis relies on imagery of science fiction uh, as well as uh, some explicit, I'm sorry for cursing, but that's how I roll when I get into it. And uh, anecdotes about focus groups, how UX comics save my ass, how to do hella cheap remote usability research, that was the reference. Uh, I promote low cost methods while simultaneously recommending more than $600 in textbooks. And uh, other subjects include PHP, CSS, SAS, Ruby, wireframes, prototyping, how to lie with UX maps, how to lie with personas, how to lie with behavior modeling, how to build a robot, a giant Eddie Murphy head on a trailer, and why writing is the most important tool for UX, and why ultimately the basis of any compelling UX is principles. So, there you have it. Uh, there will be blood. The story starts in uh, 1898, uh, the beginning of my no, actually, the future is now, right? And uh, we want to jump right to the point. Uh, we're going to go right into the middle. You see this profit there. This is a technical talk, and this is a design talk. That those are two things that typically do not go together. Uh, design is usually uh, separate from technical stuff by design, by the organization of the team structure. And uh, mentally, we think of them as being completely separate ideas for good reason. Uh, so we'll try to get our heads around that. It's not necessarily going to be pretty. Uh, there will be blood. Just going to use motherfucking shell scripts. <laughs> so how many people here are designers who came out for the design part, all right? And how many people are considering themselves like technical or into ops? 
possibly going to talk about this stuff. I'm going to address the designers first, uh, but this goes both ways, right? The technical people, like Karen was saying, need to be into the UX designer mentality. The designer people clearly need to get with the program and start using Git, start using Markdown, start using all kinds of stuff that have, I think, demonstrated very clear advantages, efficiencies, things that make the world go round. So, we can talk about writing some code. Finally, way to do it. Uh, this is by uh, the great uh, Y of Rufius, who I think has no parallel in any other code community. And uh, so, yeah, just seriously, just write it. You can draw it out in your notebook if you want to. It's not much. I'm just kidding, right? That would be decent, though. Or Nonprofit where I've been for five, six, maybe almost seven years now called Median. Median uh, is awesome. If you follow them, you'll get a stream of uh, multilingual international stuff uh, that you probably have never seen before. So, uh, unless you're into the world of Arabic and uh, you know, international perspective on journalism, Median is a great way to uh, dip into some new kinds of content strategy. And this really is about content strategy, which is to say, it isn't all about bullshit. Talking about UX, right? This is a world of industry terms, buzzwords. I invented one just to get you guys in here. Uh, who knows what design ops means? It could mean anything I want to. And even worse, I'm just going to make you feel bad the whole time. I'm going to keep using language that tells you, why aren't you doing this already? You don't have that book. You don't have that book. Man, you guys are way behind. It. So we live in this kind of uh, technocratic, deterministic world where, you know, we're in the future, but you guys are in the past. And if you could only catch up, you know, you'd be as fast as we are, and that's constantly the language that I see. So I'm going to go straight into some examples now, and I'm just preface a um, little concrete thing here. Start with Terminator 2, as usual. So the mentality that I see a lot of times is something like this, I will make you an advanced persona. And if you're in the UX world, you know there's a lot of controversy about personas and about this kind of document, which seeks to represent the user's mind, right? You do mental modeling, do some research document, it has some pretty faces on it, some pithy blurbs, and that's supposed to guide your understanding of the user. And there's a controversy about that because it doesn't really work. And I have like Arnold coming into the bar, you can size them up to measure their pants with your uh, Google Glass or however that works, and then you, uh, you, know, you end up taking down the guy who fits your model exactly, right? And uh, so then we think that we have this dude's identity figured out, uh, it ends up going stale sitting on your... Uh, Internet, and then uh, we have something that I would like to call kitty shit. That's uh, computer bullshit. So here's Eddie Murphy. Part. <laughs> That's another example of some bullshit. Just use a retrospective, right? This is a particularly agile flare, uh, which is uh, retrospective is a very useful technique for teams that are kind of uh, you know looking backwards. So a retrospective is held up as some kind of thing that's going to solve your problems. The problem is maybe with your team, and it doesn't really work out all starry-eyed like this, you know. So this is the kind of scenario that we imagine when we're writing these books that sell for however much money. You know, just use Magic Cat, right? If you can hear it, just fail faster. You've heard that one probably. That's a Silicon Valley thing. I don't know if that's agile or lean or whatever, but... I kind of have a problem with this one. I think it's a good way to understand uh, some of the internal contradictions, right? Why should I fail? What if I didn't fail? Did I do it wrong? And it reminds me of some old Dreamweaver uh, dialogue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to talk about contradictions. Let's be honest. It's not always quite so pretty. Saying just often just made ten million dollars during a series C evaluation. So when Silicon Valley talks about their stories, it might look easy, but a lot of times it's not quite so simple. Here's a good Valley lore. Uh, 
Odeo failed and turned into Twitter, right? How could that not be a success? Can you imagine what it was like to work at Odeo when they were failing? That's probably uh, one of the most painful failures that you could uh, have been through. And the uh, evidence of their genius had not yet been demonstrated, so they probably felt pretty bad. The thing about user experience research is that it never really analyzes itself. You talk to your users and you end up with something that's uh, supposed to just be useful. And uh, when I say that, uh, I feel like people look at me like this. <laughs> okay. And this is the terminology that I keep seeing repeated over and over again. Just, simply, must, and I'll say it. I told you it's a talk about contradictions. Uh, but you know, when you hear these words, Collectively agree to do something like this if I say it. I see them. Yeah. You guys like Groundhog Day? Bill and Murray? Here's the one that I was doing just last year. Uh, just use a typical tracker. <laughs> That'll make you agile. You got consultancy, bro. <laughs> so, what motivates this kind of thing? And uh, how do we get ourselves into this kind of predicament? Let's just talk about fear. Fear makes us do all kinds of stupid things, as we know, in our relationships and our work life. Uh, fear comes from a sense, I think, fundamentally, that we're just wrong, that we are actually wrong in our heads. And uh, maybe, you know, we're just lazy, uh, which is a great myth. Uh, unless you're actually lazy, then sorry, I, I can't really help you, but most of the people I know who feel the most lazy are the ones who are sitting around at the computer for 18 hours a day, destroying their bodies, working their brains out. So I'm not sure how laziness fits in or why it feels so compelling as a sense of guilt for many of us who get finger wagged from Silicon Valley consultants and we don't get to just do things. So there you go. It gets a little bit scary. This is a talk about shame. Not just fear that we internalize or that we feel afraid to take confidence in our design decision, which is a requirement for taking action, right? It talks about shame as something that people put on you, which I think you can totally fail, uh, totally fail. And this is a talk about work. And work, I think, has the possibility to transcend some of these things as long as we have a team that's able to uh, get us over the hump. We need uh, a little bit of fun now and then. I really love John Cleese as a source of inspiration. He says that uh, there's no greater way to uh, get into the creative spirit than to have fun. Uh, he talks about uh, something that really helped me uh, put this talk together, actually. A closed mode and an open mode. Uh, he was working on Monty Python and becoming you know, one of the most famous comic creators in the world. Uh, he said that he intensively needed to pursue his space, which was closed, so that he could come out of it and be open and confident about his design decisions. Uh, if you can imagine working on Monty Python, uh, what a team, right? You have to have true confidence to be able to present an idea about a sketch, uh, a sketch and uh, you know, be able to follow through with that in a way that was going to you know, knock out all the other grades on the team uh, to achieve your vision. So I think that's what it's like a lot of times when you feel like you're a designer working with a team that maybe doesn't get it. And designers are often pitted against people on their team. They have to be uh, the sparkly creative type, which is also a, a very damaging uh, posture to be in. And, uh, oh, right, it's a quadruple. Uh, so the context of this is uh, DevOps, uh, which if you're not familiar with that terminology, um, dev means development, ops means operations. And traditionally, there was a world of people who managed the servers and the world of people who wrote the code that went up on it. And increasingly, we're seeing a movement to bring those two things together. Uh, those two worlds can work together so the developers can deploy and operations. It's not really quite said this way so frequently, but the expectation is that everyone can do more of everything. So I was into that. Uh, I have some agile training background, and I think that that's not like a brilliant idea because uh, I like to stick my thumb to everything up the servers as frequently as possible. Uh, but recently I've been trying to stay more in a design role and to be able to you know, have confidence about decisions and find ways to advance uh, user experience, which is uh, you know, typically not something that you can really do when you're deep in uh, some kind of uh, module building. So, design
assigned DevOps seems like a natural extension to me. And then taking out the middleman, sign ops, sounds good, right? Maybe I'll write a book. Uh, the point is that designers can keep up too. And uh, like Karen was saying, and speaking to the developers, uh, there's plenty of room for the developers to take on the user experience role, just like there's plenty of room for the designers to start taking on the development role, and even the operations role. It's not that scary anymore. It's not like it was five years ago when you deploy a server, you had to SSH it, and you would get pull and make sure you didn't break anything because the database had to be migrated. And we got that, oh my god, we just lost three weeks of data because we got to deploy last week. So, uh, yeah, designers can do this now because the tools are just getting simpler. So, I don't think it's a matter of uh, you know, changing our perspective about ourselves as much as just being able to acknowledge the kind of layer of layer of abstraction that's happening every day. And uh, I encourage you to look around. I really take a lot of inspiration from the Ruby community personally, um, just because I think that they uh, happen to they have uh, you know, cornered some of these uh, terms and have the best uh, facility for explaining them. Drupal, by contrast, a world that I love for this, don't get me wrong. Uh, Drupal is a world of practitioners. The DrupalCon, you're talking to people who are running websites that they really care about and are not obsessed with making sure that uh, their position on uh, non relational databases is perfectly in sync with the most recent conference circuit. Uh, Drupal World is a world of people who are managing content. And that is a huge advantage of the user experience. Uh, if anyone wasn't in the last uh, keynote just now, please uh, check out that video because it explains that. Concept really well. I think that uh, in a world where PHP and Drupal may be put down, we're made to feel guilt or shame for not having absolutely perfect non relational schemas or whatever. Uh, we might lose the thread and think that uh, this is all about a technocratic thing where we're trying to change the world through performance optimization. We're going just fast enough, thanks very much. Uh, it's time to think about higher level values. My perspective is, as a user, I can smell your bullshit coming. So, if all you're thinking about is speed, I might appreciate that when the page loads first, uh, but I'm not going to stick around and have a really durable user experience or build a relationship with you based on performance metrics. I don't even want to know about those things. I'd like them to go away completely. So, it's a kind of marginal perspective to keep working on user experience from a technical point of view. And that's why I think there's an inherent contradiction in the uh, thing that's indicated by a uh, design ops. Pairing those three things together maybe loses a sense of what design is really about. So, uh, that's not what you wanted to hear. You wanted to hear some techniques. So, let's talk about techniques. I'm going to take it way down to the design ops is not the same thing as pushing buttons in Capistrano web UIs or whatever. Uh, so, sketching, yeah. The old standby of user experience, right? It's a pretty good place to figure out your workflow. How do you sketch? Like, what kind of paper do you use? Be a nicer paper. How do you do it? You know, a lot of people think of sketching as getting a big fat sharpie, and you gotta go fast, we're gonna fail fast, we gotta fail. Slow down. Some words, you know, like think about the words you're writing down on the page. I love doing these concept diagrams because um, I do my nice paper and I write them slowly. In five years, I can come back. This guy from 2008, it's a lecture I went to. It's a concept diagram that I just used to ground the whole conversation at a team retreat last week. I poured it out of the air. I mean, it felt good, right? And that's because I had high quality archival paper or something like that. I, uh, I took a photo, you know. I mean, I made it an archive. And, and that's what I think is pretty cool about design ops. The idea that you don't just take it and throw it away. 37 Sigma said you should throw away all your sketches because they all need to go into the thing. So what the hell are you sketching for then? Just write it in code then. I mean, it's not that valuable then. Make it something valuable, right? Practice your circle. There are no little stray lines coming out of my circles, right? That's made with 
and half a freaking million here my God. It's not that easy. And those little arrows, they're meaningful. Uh, recently, I like to label the connectors a little bit more so they read like sentences and you don't have to kind of guess. You, know? you don't want to be fuzzy later. You want it to actually be statements, words, compositions. So think about reading it in a few years and you've completely forgotten where you're at. Because the thing I keep finding, all my old stuff is better. Older is better. So pins, uh, yeah, I love these pins. I think there's a general principle. These are really long and kind of awkward and they look weird. Uh, they come in a big box of multiple colors, which is neat. A whole black and white is perfectly fine. Uh, the main point is the harder your office supplies are to steal, uh, the longer they'll stick around. So, yeah, I'm actually totally serious about that. Get some weird stuff in your office and it will make you feel different when you sit down to work. That's a pretty good operations hack. It's a very easy experience for people to do. Um, get one gray marker. Just one gray marker. I said yes, right? I just told you, just here I am telling you my secrets of my consultant trade, right? Okay, just use sheet paper, it's cool. Uh, seriously, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's however you want to roll. You do not need archival quality stuff if you have your iPhone. Camera has documentation, right? There's plenty of books about that. And anyway, design art stuff. Because this is all about you, right? I'm trying to tell you that we don't have solutions which are universally applicable. Don't have them. So when you read a book that says this is universally applicable, you should have that red light going on. Just do this. You must do this. No, 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 no. My team is totally different than your team. Trust me. Here's a framework you can throw out. Uh, I like to think about principles at the bottom of that, right? So user experience, bullshit detectors. User experience people are pretty good bullshit detectors, but there's nothing like an end user to tell you something about uh, how uh, bullshit you're at. So good principles, I think, is the foundation of something to really work with. If you can choose your clients, please choose your clients. I'm not going to tell you that that's easy. I know that making money is the point of most of this uh, strategy talk. And then options in the middle between those principles, like why we're here, other books will call them um, assumptions that you can validate with metrics. That all sounds like a lot of business rhetoric to me. So options sitting between what you think you want to do, what you decided your business is going to do, or your mission is, and then the result comes out of that. And then let's remember that the result is not a user experience. That is still to be determined, and it will be determined in tens of thousands of different ways. You do not need to design a user experience. You design a UI and you hope. Here's a like next slide. This is like classic usability language, right? Just ask people what they think about your website. Just build empathy. Say this one more time. No, wait, actually, I did that and uh, it wasn't really that scary. Let you do that. Unless, of course, your users are scary, right? I mean, people are pretty insane. You never know what somebody's going to do. If you've actually gotten on the phone or asked people what they think, sometimes they will tell you the most crazy stuff. So, if your users are scary, I think design ops still has a role. You can still do better sketches. Uh, you can still work on your circles. Anyway, the point is about your team. The real source of what's holding you back, right? We had this idea of the dream team sitting in this dark with some kind of bioluminescent LCD or whatever. We're designing some cool car. People are going to love it. The reality is often more like uh, but uh, I'm lonely. Yeah, I don't think it really works out that way. Seriously, this is the scary part. You come out of your weird design cavern from your weird design planet. It's definitely scary. And then there's them. Of course, you look scary as hell. I mean, how are they supposed to deal with you? They're looking at the clock trying to make the page load in under 200 milliseconds, and you're talking about some crazy ass module configuration. They can read you, you can read them. It becomes a them versus us thing. So uh, I think that's what uh, Karen's advice was, right? Let's distribute the idea of the designer's goal. Let's make it more about facilitation and help each other see we all are actual users. There's no end user if we're actually using the product ourselves. I think that's a huge shortcut. You really don't need to do user testing if you can just make it every day yourself. It's an amazing shortcut. It takes strategy. You can choose your clients. Maybe you have to put on a different hat in the morning or start a new 
the summer project, and I started writing. Uh, I took years of not writing uh, to catch up with the journalism part. And once I got my mind into that role and I started to fear the publishing moment, everything started to click for me. And so I think that that's a great way to cut out this feedback loop, uh, which can take a week or so, and you end up getting much more actionable results. You know, the mileage may vary. I can't tell you how that's going to work for you. My point is really about confidence, because you're going to have to put on the Sparker suit at the end of the day and demo this damn thing. And being able to be confident about what you think or what you know is really key to making sure that things go through and being able to have a serious answers for people who are asking you serious questions is super important. So how do you get people to accept your designerly wishes, you know, just roll up your sleeves, right? Just takes a little bit of digital persuasion. <laughs> persuasion comes very easily once you've entered the lodge of research, which is a complete bullshit. Research? Are you kidding me? You talk to one person. Does it have IRB? Does it have a PhD? No. It's not research. You're just talking to people. Design art is just confidence. It's just about getting your shit together. I say define those terms and stick to them. Think about the terms that you're using more than anything else. The words are critical. Version control. Get into Git. Just check it out once if you're not into it. See if you can kind of get your head around it. Yeah, fall back on Google Docs. Back up your stuff with the uh, time machine, whatever. Just be able to pull stuff out when your computer crashes. That's a huge ops failure. Your hard drive is going to fail. Actually, I actually have two drives on my laptop. You can take out the uh, optical drive, pop in another SSD. Brilliant. So, version control here doesn't just mean Git or whatever flashy uh, CDS you want. But yeah, the point is, you did wireframes? Great. There's some cool wireframes. Style. Put it in some kind of wireframe hub. Like, where are they? They need to be actionable. They need to be visible. Your team needs to see them. Or wants to, I hope. Here's ours. Uh, you may notice it's pretty cool. It's pretty basic, right? It's just a matter of uh, organizing some kind of structure here. I'm not trying to tell you that you need to do this. We do have some software. Uh, this part is going to be on GitHub. It's linked to uh, actually the entire operating system. A little bit more opsy than design opsy. The point is really here about the URL. It lives with your team that everyone can go to. Uh, this was born out of a frustration with Google Docs uh, last year. We needed a place to put images that had comments on them. So we thought, gee, this for Drupal people. We can turn on a Drupal site for this. And then it sat there. It's never had more than 10 lines of CSS written for it. It didn't take that long. Uh, really, the point was we needed stable IDs. Right? We needed to have URLs for these elements of our architecture. Here's the same project architecture. Notice the blue things. That's important. Those little tags there that we used, uh, key codes for each section. It's a very typical site, right? It's just broken out, exploded like that diagram I showed at the beginning. And then the key is we put the, the, the little labels on there, and they don't change. They haven't changed in a year and a half. And then we can begin to show different iterations of each of those sections. Navigation and sub navigation, each of those becomes a URL within our scheme. So you can see where I'm going with this. It's not necessarily any cure all solution. It's just a matter of having a linked IA. Your architecture is going to guide your whole project in every conversation, every meeting. Please make it hyperlinked, you know. And then, yeah, put it in spreadsheets. Once you've got those links, put those bad boys all together. We got them linked up to our bug tracker. Which show where it appears in the live site. You can link that to your QA routine. Remember, QA is user experience. Uh, you can link that to your optimization routine. And uh, Google Drive API now is totally amazing. You can write a shell script, or anyone on your team can, in about two or three lines, you can start pulling these cells out, and then you can put them in something beautiful. I'm not recommending anything beautiful, actually. I think the ugly stuff is pretty awesome. So, yeah, spreadsheets, man. Google Docs for you. Google Docs has really matured in the last few years. As much as I would love to tell you, go download our whole stack and have all the solutions, you know, that is some consultant good shit. I'm sorry, this is a, really a Google Docs driven solution. Uh, when you find a cheaper, better solution that lets you log in with multiple accounts and manage permissions, uh, do it. If you want to build it your 
yourself so that you can put actual CSS in it, do it. Timelines, do it. Don't use base camp. That crap is bloated. Put that stuff in a spreadsheet. The best teams in the world, and I've talked to some really amazing practitioners, they're using spreadsheets. It blows my heart. I never thought it would work out this way. I used to hate Google Docs, and that was why we went down such a path of doing custom things. But man, you can't beat it when you've got 18 people from all over the world in a staff call putting comments on the cell 815. That's pretty powerful. As uh, Mac and Windows sync, sorry, Linux has, uh, it links up to your file system. So you push sync, it's got all your stuff on your file system. I spent the last two weeks completely offline on airplanes. I was on an island off the coast of Seattle on a team retreat. I was really grateful to have everything synced up to my file system. But when I'm organizing stuff, I like to do it in Finder and Mac OS X uh, because I can just blaze through it. I can even use Grid, which is something that integrates with the Photoshop. So now we're cooking, right? Now you can go into your file system and you can say, okay, that's archived. We're closing it up. You're moving it over here. Everything gets synced up and it's at the top of everyone's uh, list in the Google Drive. So uh, that's pretty amazing. UX test plan, put it in there, man. Just drop it in. Let people comment on this stuff. General philosophy. Link all the things. Here's the graphic that illustrates linking all the things. Uh, we like to use Flickr for a lot of our deliverables because we're Creative Commons nerds and open source. Uh, we were using Tracker like I confess. Uh, GitHub. Just stream all that stuff into a hub, right? Why should you have to bounce around? Uh, if your executive is spending time loading up 20 different bookmarks, uh, that's a pretty expensive non-decision to make. Here's the very first version of this, which I did uh, two years ago. No longer exists, but I preserved the screenshot just to show how ugly my stuff can get. Get as ugly as a service. <laughs> now it's ugly ass. That is, it's so ugly that it's ugly as a service. I prettied it up eventually before uh, any of our stakeholders looked at it, but really that was just kind of like, oh shit, the boss is coming by. Uh, this just shows some simple RSS parsing. You can see the architectural emphasis is a little older than the, uh, the wireframe site we built in Drupal. Um, and then on the right-hand side, it has things for new employees. So when you're making this kind of a hub, the hub really is just the kernel of my, uh, my recommendation here. When you're making this kind of hub, you know, think about it from the perspective of a new user, uh, that is, a user of your organizational intranet or a new employee, right? They need to be able to jump between the stuff on the first day. So you might as well articulate. Another great thing, uh, which I like, this is a kind of high-level concept, uh, is an experience map. That's Lawrence of Arabia in the background, in case you are a crazy ego bitch man. Uh, he's the craziest ego there ever was. He's him. So an experience map is a hugely ego-boosting thing. And first of all, you get this awesome deliverable, which can be filled with bullshit if you want. I mean, that could be a lie there, a lie there. The text is so small, who's going to tell? A nice spiral. Anytime you see a very complete spiral, just think about a toilet and you're flushing. <laughs> and that little thing on the right there looks kind of like a tapeworm coming through your organism. You can imagine yourself, you know, kind of like Commander Riker and Lieutenant Warp, where you know you, get, you feel, feel kind of pro when you're looking at that stuff. And seriously, it really does help. The key is understanding that the bullshit is already there, and your job as an experienced person is something like a bullshit detector, right? Just like it ever was. Uh, the ability to see the bullshit and accept the bullshit as a way of life is key because if you can't recognize it when it's there, then you're going to not be able to recognize it when it's everywhere else. So if we're making things that are intrinsically simple, like the map is not the territory, but we still need a map. We still need these things that we can hold on to, like the gumbo feather, right? You guys know gumbo, right? You got this feather, you think you're flying. Turns out it wasn't the damn feather. It's not the damn map either. You just hold it there so you can look cool when stakeholders come around. And uh, here's one that actually is more concrete. Here's one that I made to represent um, our project, uh, Check Desk, which is uh, 
fact-checking workflow uh, versus journalists, right? So we tried to model, uh, I was thinking of it as, a, as an engagement ladder. Uh, so you're progressively getting into uh, your experience. And that really helps you understand exactly uh, where the person's experience mental model is at as they go through these stages. You're not just making some kind of a monolithic front door, right? So you want to segment according to case capabilities, according to roles. So here at the bottom, this person is an athlete who went on Facebook, which is, you know, uh, the answer for. And uh, then they go up and they say, oh, this seems important to me. I get it. So they're reading the copy and they're thinking about uh, that kind of a flow. And uh, they go out and they're real satisfaction. Here. In the end, hopefully, they're coming into some kind of pro journalist hacker mode. So uh, you feel pretty awesome when you have that all laid out. Research results. I really like remote research. You can do phone calls, talk to people, digest the stuff in no time. Um, I think a great way to do research, by the way, is the, the way uh, meetup.com pioneered, I think. I'm sure someone else did it first, but they got the blog post up first. And they talk about getting the whole team in this meeting. Uh, they do it at lunch, every week. And so this is not something that you hire a consultant to do. And uh, as a former consultant with disability research, let me tell you, Nobody ever implements the changes that we recommend, uh, even when they love them. You know, I look back on every single project that I've worked on. Uh, we never really got through to the organization. I think that there must be some rule like if you have to hire a consultant to do the user experience, you're going to fail. So you do research, right? You're making a, a, a nice uh, thing with it, but it's bigger. So how does that work out for you? What was the result? Design ops is not really that complicated. Fortunately, we're only 130 slides in. So, there's many other things that can fit into this framework, right? Templates are a pretty good one. Stencils, you know? So, think about a stencil from that point of view. Uh, are these things really good for design and thinking about really inspiring people? Uh, yes and no. Uh, a lot of times, this advice is going to come to you from a teammate, not a user asking for templates, not necessarily a boss. It's someone who's heard about this thing. Present to you as if it is the secret to success. I love this guy. He embodies the idea. I'm going to use Twitter Bootstrap now. Just use Twitter Bootstrap. Oh, really? So here's a UI pattern, right? These kids are designing at the superficial level. What the hell did you do to my markup? That's the thing I hear at Drupal. Uh, Twitter Bootstrap is great if you did it from the beginning and you're actually bootstrapping. If you're in the middle of a project and you start bootstrapping, there's something wrong, right? You'll have a problem. And in general, these ideas of uh, pattern libraries and stuff, they can get really wonkish. And uh, you'll find whole books there. I totally recommend them. Check them out. I mean, shit, you can just read how to solve login patterns. And, you know, don't need a consultant. That's good. Um, but yeah, actually, that's, that's a good idea. Here's a good example. Uh, GitHub. They do an amazing uh, style guide thing. This is written by uh, Kyle Mink, who created some of in your SAS, your CSS, CSS, um, they uh, they actually allow you to do inline markup, and then that can automatically generate documents. Boom! That's awesome. Uh, that is the spirit of design ops. Then you get cool things like this. You get to see different button states, drop down stuff, all taken out of the context of your app. So your designers are people who are not trying to deal with you know, database migrations to focus on. Just a brief aside here on how this works. Typically, you would write CSS, and then, lo and behold, the browser gets CSS. Um, so, SAS, by contrast, is defining the UI modules. You encapsulate them in these little files, and then uh, Compass is managing SAS. You can also use SAS, but I highly recommend you uh, use Compass and SAS for uh, Well, I'm not going to go there. Maybe. Anyway, there's this thing in the middle, then, that takes over your CSS, and you're becoming more expressive, killer design technique. Not a designer who's used to working with CSS, then uh, I really recommend it. And now even uh, Drupal has uh, some crazy features that they're porting over. Uh, so you don't even have to use a Ruby development format or anything. Uh, but yeah, again, it's not as easy as it looks. Uh, I recommend starting simple and working up. First, you make the docs. You do need docs, although part of the point here is hold on, not too many. Then you share them, figure out some kind of backbone for your system. Make 
sure you have the energy and the willpower to improve them. I mean, these are critical aspects that you cannot get up to uh, at a dashboard level experience until you actually have something to link to. And then, uh, you know, think about the role here. Are you talking about allowing some executive to kick back the future, reflect on uh, usability reports? Uh, it doesn't really have to uh, be the future where you're looking back at usability test results from the two weeks ago. To look at them immediately. The point is, get rid of the docs so the team feels a sense of emphasis around that process. You're doing a test, get everybody in the test and make a decision right after it. It's such a better workflow than having to sit around and get stale on your internet. The point is not docs. Docs are deadly for your team. The point is the basics. Let's get back to labels and words. Let's get back to filing systems and gird arts. So here's the thing it really comes down to writing. You are a facilitator, so your expressiveness is really the key aspect of what we're working on. I just went on this retreat, and I was completely inspired by some of the colors that I saw, and I was reminded of the profound contradiction of this talk. Design is not about operations. I saw these little overturned dinghies and the crazy lichen epiphytes and driftwood, and it reminded me that ops is just a kind of exoskeleton way to externalize and clarify what we're working on, not something that should be wagging your dog. Don't fear, don't blame, don't shame. Just feel confident, whatever it takes to do it. Facilitate, stay in that role where you really respect the input of the other people on your team as users. They may not want to pick up the pen, they may not want to think that they have an opinion, but if you can get them to actually use the app, then they'd be just as valuable as uh, talking to somebody on the other end of the world. You know? Creativity really requires it. Brings me to us. And in contrast to uh, the previous keynote talk, I do think the future is us because you have to design them before they design you. And also, I told you, motherfucking shell scripts. So, yeah, I'm serious, man. Here we go. You ready for this? Here's a little shell script that I write to help me write. And uh, I know just enough shell scripting to uh, get through this kind of thing. I set up some variables at the top. I define some sounds. Sound design is part of the user experience, right? And then I have little shortcuts there, three of them. One is uh, un.write. I like to prefix things that are personal with un. That's my handle on Twitter. I'm thinking it so just kind of works. So this is an alias uh, that lets me just say, I want to start writing. And instead of getting all this crap in the way, where am I going to write? I'm going to, I do obsessively carry notebooks in my pocket. I like to, to do handwritten stuff. Getting things straight into your computer sometimes is the important part. And then I have a command to help me review things. I use Sublime Text, so that says Sublime Text, open my drafts folder, and uh, yes, say ice cold. Uh, so, you gotta hear that, right? Sorry, I can't hear So, when I review something, oops, that's the command. Words on dot review as defined in that shell script there. Ice cold. You like that? And when I do something, I like to have a little sense of reward, right? Why not? So if I do on dot write, I'm sorry, you can't see this, I'm just typing on dot write, then that opens my door, gives me a little sense of reward, and it's created this, which is um, the directory structure for uh, my day. So here's some random notes that I just opened. Um, I have a public file, a private file, and a DM file. That's my job, right? So I create each one of those files because I know that I'm going to be working into that kind of structure. So then I can talk about what I'm going to eat for dinner or how I'm planning my wedding in my private file that I can easily put my uh, you know, thoughts that I might blog about or that I don't care if I put them on a talk if Please don't read that up. Uh, it's really about externalizing problems. You can think about this as bots. Let your computer talk to you and give you encouragement. It's just you inside. And the whole idea of these checklists and stuff can just fall away. Because engineering creativity, I think, is the biggest contradiction. The engineers are living in a world of abstractions, which are completely of their own making, floating in this kind of world, pushing on these glass objects. And that is a total fantasy. If you're a U.S. person, your job is to break out of that. You do not want to look like these dudes in lawnmower man. It's a dream of the 21st 
29s. Orlandia Joe, come on, you I do not want to look like this guy in the 80s. We are pioneer. He may be get out. It's a very good term. Goo, get out of the building. I completely respect that. And when you see something that fits neatly into a hexagonal diagram, please understand you need to get out of that. Memorize it. Yes, learn it. You need to be able to recite this stuff if you want to sell contracts, right? Useful, usable, desirable. You can't argue with these things. That's the problem. Memorize them, but don't internalize them. Use the grid, but use it to break it. Think about your architecture as something that can be very dangerous. This is the desire for the town to come. A prison, which would allow total surveillance, not unlike some of the things we build around here. Learn it to critique it. Learn to see your architecture as something that can support you, but something that can help you break out. Agile UX, finally coming around to some of the industry stuff. Agile UX uh, is a very new term, and this book blew my mind when I read it, because after all these years of Agile, I realized I had never seen an interaction designer working with these people. Agile Experience Design is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Uh, Lindsay Ratcliffe and uh, Mark McNeil. Uh, Lean UX, uh, that's also another buzzword. I hope you're getting the sense of where I'm going with this. Use it, but break out of it. When you read Lean UX, notice that it's all about business strategy. It's all still client-driven, which I think is one of the classic problems of Agile in the first place. You read that manifesto and you hear the language about being revolutionaries, but then it still comes down to something that is not quite as fundamental as your principles, which I think misses the whole point of Drupal UX, which is, yeah, we're rescuing dogs. We work with bats all over the world. You know, that's a classic Drupal set, right? We're uh, doing uh, colonoscopy research. Those are things that have specific topics that are interested in the world and trying to do things. And that is a compelling UX. If that colonoscopy research finds the right person, it's going to be much more compelling than something that just loads fast. Business needs are not real. Business needs should be human needs. User experience should be human experience. And principles, I think, not unlike Robocop, are kind of at the core, right? So let your users see those, and things will come together. I promise. Not bullshit. Use your words, write the truth, let your principles drive your UX. The future of user experience is ops, and the future of user experience is not ops. That was precisely on time. That's what I'm talking about, people. So, any questions, really? Can I, uh, can I give some answers? Wait, can you give me answers? Can somebody please get up there? I got a sticker for the first person who gets up there. We danced sticker. It's pretty awesome, actually. This is the last one. Stats are less. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a fire starter. Thanks, man. <laughs> Be on the mailing list late tonight. Uh, uh, stats are less. I would say go to the GitHub pages for each one and just check out the bug reports, right? The difference is a community issue. So, uh, I was kind of curious how you did iter uh, iterations with art files or graphic assets with Git. Yeah. Do you actually uh, sort of commit changes and then go back to this? I'm so glad you said that. If you're working in SVG, uh, because you use Inkscape, more power to you, that's hardcore. Uh, that's a plain text format. If you're creating gigantic 50 megabyte blocks, please do not put your assets in Git. I should totally wave my hands while I'm saying this. That will create a massive file that offers you very little value. So that's Google Docs. Google Docs is awesome for that. Thank you. With all the notes that uh, you make with your shell scripts there, uh, how do you refer back to those notes later or find them, or do you often refer back to them? Um, I do, yeah. I was actually able to generate uh, like 3,000 lines of notes for this talk, actually, just by typing in DrupalCon. Because I hashtag things, basically. I think about the words that I'm using. I think about how things relate. I 
don't have a formal strategy for that. You know, hashtag is folksonomic and I'm the folk, so I, I just kind of roll with it and then I can grab for keywords. Uh, more specifically, I use Sublime Text too, and when I'm working on a project, even when I'm working in a technical thing, I keep that in the search pad. So when I do a search for a certain module name, it will show me any of my own documents that reference that module. Coffee outside, guys. I would love to talk to any of you who are uh, feeling any of these things and maybe could use a little counseling. Uh, I'm happy to uh, give you more power because truly you guys are in the right spot to do some amazing user experience. So thank you so much.